Meltdown, part three of our investigation of the orgy of greed and recklessness that drove the world into financial collapse. Only now are the hard questions being asked. Only now are the key players being held to account. In this hour, some of the crash victims fight back. In Iceland, a protesting singer brings down a government. In France, a union leader oversees the kidnapping of his bosses. In California, thousands of families become homeless. He'll tell us, why can't you just give us a home like other normal kids? Meltdown, the secret history of the global financial collapse. The years since the 2008 collapse have been marked by demonstrations around the world. Owing to the loss of an estimated 30 million jobs. In many places there were violent street protests, but they were easily weathered by governments and large corporations. In some countries, however, the struggle went much further and left a lasting mark. The epicenter of this battle was in France, where workers have always been quick to the barricades. Because of the meltdown, in March 2009, the Continental Tire Company announced that it would be forced to close its factory in the town of Clairois, cutting 1,120 jobs. The plant was still showing a profit, but according to the factory boss, Louis Forzy, the workers here were just not as motivated and productive as they should be. Selon moi, et c'est les chiffres qu'il montre, nos résultats sont inférieurs à ceux des autres usines. Continental workers labeled for Z a thief and a liar. They convened a meeting at the plant to organize a protest. Forzi showed up to address them. He made a show of his patience and forbearance. Until an egg in the head changed his mind. He immediately decided that perhaps he had underestimated the situation and made a tactical withdrawal from the field of battle. Why did that happen? Why? Because uh, people were shocked. They were angry. Je pense aussi qu'il était au courant depuis longtemps qu'il allait y avoir une fermeture du site. The Continental employees moved on to occupy the town offices. When union leader Xavier Mathieu received news that a judge refused to grant them an injunction to stop the plant closing, He and the workers began trashing the place. On n'ira pas à l'abattoir sans se défendre. C'est clair et net. Le désespoir des gens qui sont foutus dehors, c'est pas de la cruauté, ça. C'est pas de la violence Si, c'est de la violence. Il n'y a pas que la violence physique dans la vie. Il y a la violence morale aussi. Moi, je suis fier de ce que les mecs, ils ont fait aujourd'hui. Et n'attendez pas... The worker uprising began to spread across the country and became increasingly threatening. The Caterpillar Heavy Equipment Company in Grenoble announced that, in spite of record profits, they would be cutting 20,000 jobs worldwide over 700 here in France. 
The global meltdown would reduce demand for their bulldozers, and so production would have to slow down. On March 2nd, workers surrounded the plant. They were following the instructions of union leader Pierre Picaretta, who, like his father before him, has worked his whole life at Caterpillar. On est des humains et on n'accepte pas là tête baissée cette économie qui 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 nous fait souffrir. Donc on ne pouvait pas accepter comme ça le fait d'annoncer des bénéfices records et de licencier les personnes. Three weeks of negotiations led nowhere. Furious workers surrounded the management offices and decided to hold the management team captive. The first union leader on the scene was Nicolas Benoit. Ce coup-là, les patrons ne sont pas partis, donc on les a obligés à venir à la table des négociations pour discuter. Ils ont refusé, donc euh, les salariés ont dit tant que tant que vous ne reprenez pas des négociations qui sont des négociations sérieuses, vous restez là. Et là, vous êtes séquestré ou pas Et Pour l'instant, non. Nicolas Polotnik led the management team that was taken prisoner. At first, he refused any further discussions with the union. Faut pas nous prendre pour des putes. Alors, monsieur, vous voulez reprendre les négociations With the Caterpillar bosses held captive, the situation became increasingly dangerous. The police did not immediately intervene. The union leaders were trying to keep control of the situation. The media were then told that the bosses would be staying the night. Overnight, as the captive bosses were trying to get some sleep in their offices, angry workers did not leave them in peace. The Caterpillar kidnapping incident made news around the world. It was widely described as boss napping. In the French Alps, at the U.S. tractor company Caterpillar, where managers were locked in and stripped of their speaker phone. Boss napped all night. President Nicolas Sarkozy realized this extreme reaction to the global meltdown was turning into a public relations disaster for France. He went on national television to denounce the kidnappers. De les séquestrer les gens. On est dans un état de droit. Je ne laisserai pas faire les choses comme ça. Dans un état de droit, la loi elle doit être respectée. Privately, however, French finance minister Christine Lagarde was critical of Caterpillar management. She thought that the situation was exacerbated by the ham-fisted tactics of the American company, a common problem with foreign-owned firms. On a souvent constaté dans des entreprises sous capitaux étrangers que le dialogue n'était pas aussi, aussi riche et aussi développé parce que, parce que le centre de décision est ailleurs. After an anxious night, Caterpillar management agreed to resume negotiations. Les organisations syndicales. Moi, je vais chercher une équipe. On va venir, on va les protéger. In exchange, the union allowed the bosses to leave the plant, although there were some tense moments on the way out. Pierre Picaretta tried to claim victory. Je pense que le message est passé et je crois que rapidement dans les jours qui vont suivre, ça va lâcher, ça va lâcher fortement. The Caterpillar bosses who were kidnapped decided to keep silent about their ordeal. But many bosses in France realized they could soon end up in a similar predicament. One of them was Marcus Carriou, the human resources manager for a U.S. car parts company called Molex. He was sent into the town of Villemur, near Toulouse, to close a Molex factory that had operated here for many years. The workers were furious, and very quickly their anger focused on Carriou along with nasty graffiti, 
Carriou says he became the target of email threats. You know, when you read about uh, some extremists, you know, saying that, uh, that uh, uh, people like me should be exterminated, you know, so it's, I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's shocking to, to see that. The town of Villemur would be hard hit by the closure of the Molex plant, which represents 20% of its tax revenues. The local parish priest, Philippe Bachet, led the community support effort for the Molex workers. Et tous ceux qui se sont mobilisés doivent continuer à l'être pour que notre ville ne devienne pas un désert industriel. On the morning of April 20th, 2009, in Villemur, Marcus Carriou was consulting a security company about how to act in case he should be kidnapped. Ironically, that afternoon, union leader Denis Paris showed up and placed him in captivity. Et on veut 5 millions d'euros aussi pour préjudice. Et on lui a dit, ben, écoutez, maintenant vous allez nous donner les explications et on va vous garder avec nous pour euh, que vous nous donniez toutes les informations pourquoi vous avez fait ça. Within one hour, there were media all over the, the plant. I felt like an animal in a cage. The people there, they offered some food. They offered us some mattresses as well so that we uh, could comfortably sleep in this office. The mattress was absolutely dirty, and also I was in touch with our, our security advisor. He said, well, you know, in uh, one out of two cases, they spit in the sandwiches, so I didn't want to touch that. After 26 hours, Max Bacchus Cariou and his colleague Colin Kolbach were released from captivity. Even as they left, they felt threatened. You could see from people shouting and screaming that there was extremely uh, heavy aggression there. My colleague, I mean, she, she came out and she was in tears afterwards because she didn't expect, uh, she had been working quite a couple of years with these people to, the, to react like this. In the end, the Molex company paid some extra compensation to the laid-off workers, but did not back down from closing the plant. The rage against Marcus Cariou only increased to the point that he travels with bodyguards as he conducts final negotiations. Cariou complained that he was treated like a monkey in a zoo, but union leader Paris openly threatens him with much worse. Il n'est pas encore parti, Kérius, il faut arriver à le séquestrer. Mais là, je parle de séquestration, il le traité comme un singe, on va y arriver. C'est fort possible que ça arrive aussi, d'ici la fin. Mais bon, euh, il verra la différence que, du traitement qu'il a eu et du traitement qu'il va avoir. Finance Minister Christine Lagarde has to walk a fine line about union militancy in France. She denounces violence and she knows that foreign companies don't like the turbulent atmosphere here. On the other hand, she points out that the people who have paid the greatest price for the global financial collapse are workers. Bon, les actionnaires vont s'en sortir. Les cours de bourse remontent. En revanche, ceux qui souffrent, ce sont évidemment euh, les effectifs des entreprises, puisqu'il y a des menaces de restructuration, puisqu'il y a des licenciements, puisqu'il y a des gens qui perdent leur job. Many in France believe that workers' fundamental rights have been violated in the wake of the financial crisis, and that workers here need to fight back. Les événements nous invitent à prendre position et à soutenir les causes justes. Father Philippe Bachet says that French workers give an example to the world by defining employment as an essential human right. Ce sont des gens qui n'acceptent pas facilement ce qu'on leur propose, ce qu'on leur fait faire. Et donc ils, ils, ils se raidissent et ils, ils, défendent, ils défendent à la fois leurs droits C'est normal. Ils essayent de défendre aussi euh, leur travail. Et le travail, c'est aussi très important pour l'homme. L'homme a besoin de travailler. Iceland was a microcosm of everything that went wrong during the global financial crisis. The sudden collapse of the country's banks in the fall of 2008 wiped out the pensions and savings of most Icelanders. 
Every citizen was now saddled with a debt estimated at $350,000 per person. Icelanders were furious at the greed of bankers and government cronyism that contributed to the meltdown. In early 2009, some took to the streets to express their dissatisfaction. First, they surrounded the national parliament, and protest leaders appealed to the public to come out and support them. I sort of wasn't very optimistic that we would be able to mobilize the people. But every week, every day, you got such shocking news that completely shook the foundations of, you know, your sense of what was moral. The immorality that was uh, exposed to us was so shocking that people started to come together. The Reykjavik police moved into position to protect the parliament. Inevitably, there were scuffles. Nothing like this had ever happened in Iceland, and both sides were unsure how to proceed. On January 21st, the anger focused on Icelandic Prime Minister Ger Harde. His car was surrounded and pelted with eggs and garbage. He was shaken by the incident, especially because it came shortly after a difficult visit to his doctor. When people were attacking my car, I had gotten the diagnosis the night before that I had, had cancer. So uh, all, the, all of this in my memory is very, very vivid. I can understand why people were angry, particularly those who had lost money, who had lost their jobs. There was a, a crisis that nobody had really expected of enormous proportions. Icelandic poet and singer Hordur Torfason was the main protest leader. I said to the people, we are all angry, but use your anger as a positive force. Don't destroy, don't use violence, don't attack people, don't go to the homes of the politicians, because that's private. We can never use anger to, to destroy. Torfesson asked the crowd to go home and get their pots and pans, then come down and serenade the politicians in the parliament. <laughs> It was new for Icelanders, ordinary people to come out and, and do something sort of illegal, like uh, not obeying police orders and so forth. And in the end, it almost became tribal. There were so many people with pots and pans and homemade drums, and there was this beating and the fires outside the parliament. In a sense, it was sort of the unbearable lightness of being to be there to experience this within the nation and to see the joy and experience the joy when we finally got what we wanted. On January 23rd, Icelandic Prime Minister Ger Harde addressed his countrymen on national television and announced that he was resigning due to illness. <laughs> His governing coalition fell apart. National elections were called. The new government in Iceland was left to clean up the incredible mess left by the bankers and politicians who preceded them. Stein Grimer Sigfusson became the new finance minister. Obviously the international crisis are hitting a lot of countries, but in Iceland it's probably uh, more painful than almost anywhere else because uh, things were taking so, to such extremes in Iceland. This uh, neoliberal uh, privatization experiment uh, that was driven forward by greed and bad practices in, in business had a terrible ending and now we are paying the price. And, and like usually, it's not the people that cause the problem that have to tie up, tidy up afterwards. Many Icelanders feel they are living in the ruins of a collapsed society. Every night, Reykjavik police see the symptoms, like an upswing in domestic violence. 
Here a woman has called for help because her estranged husband has broken into her house and grabbed her baby in a fit of drunken desperation. The police calmly talk the unemployed man into giving up without a fight. Constable Stefan Einerson says police here are sympathetic with people who become despondent after they lose their jobs. We're just people like everybody else. We have mortgages and car payments we have to make. So we're in the same situation as everyone else. Protest leader Birgitta Johnsdottir was elected to the Icelandic parliament. I feel incredibly strange and at the same time I feel deeply honored to be trusted, to be in there. I will just carry on doing what I was elected to, to be sort of a, a bridge or a voice for ordinary people, for the grassroots movements within this building there. As a result of the meltdown, young people in Iceland decades of high taxes and reduced social services to help pay off the debts run up by Icelandic banks. At this art college in Reykjavik, the students are multilingual, well-educated and mobile. And there is a great fear that a high proportion of them will just give up on Iceland and move to other countries. Korto Jabali is one who plans to emigrate. Uh, most of the people I know don't want to live here forever. They, they all want to leave. Like everyone. I don't, know why, I don't know one single person in my age that really wants to stay in Iceland. Yeah. Icelandic protest leader Horder Torfesson has resumed his career as a performer. He realizes that many of his countrymen are demoralized and that many young people want to leave. But he is quite sure that Iceland can still have a bright future. I think many of these people, if they go away and they see, they look around in the world and they start value, revaluing, or seeing what really they will come back. I traveled the world, I've, I've, I've seen so many things that's, I think this society is a very good one and we have the opportunity to build it up. And I see signs of this beginning. People are really standing together and helping each other. In confronting the problems of a failed economy, Iceland at least has the advantage of a strong social safety net. The situation is much more difficult in what is being called the Western world's most surprising failed state, California. In the three months following the meltdown, there were an estimated one million foreclosures in the United States, sweeping many middle-class families into poverty. Tent cities began springing up across the country as the homeless desperately searched for somewhere to spend the night. This one suddenly appeared in a field in Sacramento, California, the capital of a state that was long considered America's richest. It was reminiscent of the tent cities that appeared in this area during the Great Depression of the 1930s. In those days, they were called Hoovervilles, after then U.S. President Herbert Hoover. Back then, homeless people camped along the banks of the Sacramento River at the edge of town. And again today, the homeless have pitched their tents in the exact same spot. It is a dangerous place because the river can suddenly overflow its banks and flood the area. Bill Diola says they have tried to camp in safer places in Sacramento, but were chased away. The camping law states that if you're inside the city limits, you cannot pitch a tent for more than 24 hours. You can't camp in one spot for more than 24 hours, even with written permission from the property owner. I'm two months homeless. This is all new to me. These guys lead me the way. Municipal officials in Sacramento quickly ordered the big tent cities dispersed, 
and did everything in their power to drive the homeless out of their jurisdiction. Many were arrested or fined. The Harrelson family of Sacramento have been homeless for months. When debt overcame them, they sold their house and tried to move in with relatives, but it didn't work out. They are on bicycles now because they can't afford a car, which is sadly ironic because Francis is a retired auto worker. I worked for General Motors for about 30 years. And then uh, I got an early, I, when they came out with the early retirements, I jumped on it. Thought it was a good deal. Didn't turn out to be. <laughs> the family has spent some nights camping beside the Sacramento River, which Angelina did not enjoy. <laughs> I'm a girly girl. I don't like bugs. I don't like dirt. And it gets really cold at night. And then being dark outside and knowing that there's critters around like skunks or raccoons terrifies me. <laughs> the Harrelson's eight-year-old son, Joseph, attends the Mustard Seed School in Sacramento, a school specially for children who are homeless. We do recess, then we go in, and we eat breakfast there, and we do a journal and deal well. And after the afternoon, we do math or science, just fun stuff. Today. After the global financial collapse knocked so many families out of their houses and down below the poverty line, there are now over 1.5 million homeless children in the United States. This school is privately funded by a charity called Loaves and Fishes. It's not uncommon when the kids first come, you know, we have sack lunches that groups in the community have fixed for the kids and um, a child will be eating her lunch and the teachers will notice that she's hiding food. Um, and when asked, um, that little girl will say, well, it's for my mother. I know she's gonna be hungry. And for a child to be hiding food to take care of her hungry mother is not the way things should be. What is this? There's times where he gets really frustrated at us and he'll tell us, why can't you just give us a home like other normal kids? I want my own room back. It breaks my heart when he gets frustrated like that. It really breaks my heart to have to sit there and tell him, you know, I'm sorry. More and more charity organizations are stepping up to offer food and clothing to the homeless, but the demand just keeps growing. Almost two years after the meltdown, Unemployment and homelessness in California is still getting worse, not better. There are over 100,000 homeless military veterans in the United States, the greatest collection of them in the Los Angeles area. Many of them suffer from post-traumatic stress and other mental illnesses. One of them recently crawled into a dumpster in Santa Monica and burned himself alive. The L.A. County Jail now houses the greatest collection of mentally ill people in the country. The government here simply can't provide any other facilities or treatment for them. Please welcome the 38th governor of the state of California, Arnold governor Schwarzenegger. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger recently announced a new range of budget cuts, which will certainly make the situation even worse. But he remains optimistic. The power of California's innovators and entrepreneurs is still strong. We are still the shining city on the hill. I don't consider it by any means a failed state. Many of the governor's critics say he's turning California into a wasteland that resembles his famous Terminator movies. He doesn't see it. When I was doing movies, I enjoyed destroying everything. I mean, I uh, love blowing up buildings and love destroying cars and wiping out people and all those kind of things. So by the time the landscape was there, it was just everything was burning and everything was a wreck. But now when you turn on the news, you see the same thing when they talk about the economy. But the reality of it is, is it's not that bad. It is bad. Uh, we did go down with the economy, but uh, we're going to be okay in California. 
This debate is turning into a bit of a family feud for Republican Governor Schwarzenegger. He's married to Maria Shriver, whose family has long been associated with the Democratic Party. His brother-in-law, Bobby Shriver, is now the mayor of Santa Monica. He thinks California is a failed state. The optimistic side of the argument is the state's failed. Something radical needs to happen. The non-optimistic side, to me anyway, is look, everything's going to be okay. When in fact, it's not okay now, it's getting worse, and it could get a lot worse. You, if you're a disabled senior at home and someone comes and gives you your food and cleans your diaper once a day, that person's about to be fired. You're going to have to move out of your apartment into a nursing home where you don't know anybody in order to save $15 a day in California, the most creative, smartest group of people in America. Can't figure out how to finance that. That's a failed situation. This is absolutely outrageous. It's, it's, it's Many people believe that Canada was largely spared by the global financial crisis. The people of Windsor, Ontario, don't feel that way. In the spring of 2010, the residents of Windsor, Ontario come to a picnic to say goodbye to the General Motors Corporation. It's a bittersweet occasion. The company is bringing its 90-year history in this city to an end with the closure of its last plant here. The last 500 GM workers in Windsor are losing their jobs and joining the list of workers around the world who have been hurt by the meltdown. The auto industry has been among the worst hit. At its height, General Motors employed 7,000 workers in Windsor. But today, GM says there is just not enough work to keep this transmission plant open. As 49-year-old Ray Samard spends his last days on the assembly line, he has fond memories of the day he walked in the door in 1981. As a child, I visited the plant. As a young boy, I always said, I'm going to work at General Motors. And I got the job, and I was ecstatic. It's a beautiful thing, working for the biggest corporation in the world. Many of these auto workers started young and followed the same path as their fathers and grandfathers. Many assume they had jobs for life and don't really know how to do anything else. It came as a total shock when GM advised them in May 2008 that this plant would be closing for good. It's a sad day. I, I'm not... When I started, people left a job for me so that I could retire. I'm going to retire and I'm not leaving a job for my children. That's disheartening. It really is. You feel a bit somehow responsible for that? Sure, sure. We all do. We all have to take responsibility for that. At the height of the financial crisis, it looked as if General Motors would not be the only major casualty in the automobile sector. Chrysler was headed for bankruptcy as well. The Chrysler minivan plant in Windsor employs over 4,300 workers. Canadian federal and provincial politicians were summoned to an emergency meeting at Chrysler headquarters in Detroit. Ontario's Minister of Economic Development and Trade was there, Windsor's Sandra Popotello. They sat down with us and started talking about what their condition really was, and it was uh, it was very frightening to hear. And um, I guess being from Windsor, being brought up here, m most of our lifeblood has been from the automotive sector. I thought I would never see the day that I would hear or get a sense that this could collapse. At the height of the 2008 crisis, executives from the big three U.S. auto companies came to Washington to ask for a massive government bailout. Famously, they all arrived in private corporate jets. There was a wave of revulsion from politicians and workers. 
Who do you think you are? You're asking for $50 billion and you, you fly in on a corporate jet? Those are our profits as well. As workers, every worker... I know at our plant, they said, you've you got to be kidding me. The U.S. government came up with the bailout money, and Canada quickly followed suit. Canadian Finance Minister Jim Flaherty is the Member of Parliament for Oshawa, another riding that depends on the automotive sector. Discussions have taken place about this. this he points out that there were many jobs at stake in Canada beyond those at the big three U.S. car companies. The fundamental challenge was this, were we going to be in the auto business or not? And the big driver, from my point of view, was the fact that we have three of the largest global parts companies in the world, in Canada. And that's where most of the techno technological innovation is. So we lose Chrysler, we lose General Motors, they continue in the United States and Europe and elsewhere, we're going to lose those parts companies too because they'll have to follow them. This is absolutely outrageous. It's, it's, One group of workers in Windsor decided to fight back against their plant closing. The incident came at the Aradco Car Parts Plant, which manufactured stamped metal components for Chrysler. In March 2009, workers were called on a Monday night and told to stay home. The American-owned plant was shutting down. Aradco workers realized that their management was trying to sell all the equipment and sneak off without paying any kind of settlement to employees, some of whom had worked for decades and were owed thirty or forty thousand dollars. Not today, motherfucker! Go home! They decided to stop trucks that were arriving to empty out the plant. Then, when management still refused to negotiate with them, the workers occupied the plant. Isn't it pathetic when our guys have got to go to this length? we got to stand in a building and take over a building to get our point across. Among the union leaders standing on the roof was Jerry Farnham. Some of the workers here have decided to take over the plant. That's the only thing they have in order to try to get the monies that are owing to them. Sir, they have the right to refuse your entry. Okay, that's what they're doing. The battle moved on to a downtown hotel where Aradco's parent company was trying to hold an auction to sell off the equipment inside the plant. The workers were able to mobilize to disrupt the proceedings. There were a few tense moments until the police finally intervened. I assure you and I guarantee you that there will be no auction today. That's my promise. It turns out that the American owners of this plant were already fugitives from justice. Aradco was operated by a California company called Catalina. The company website, now defunct, shows the name Gregory Willis as chief executive officer. This Michigan document shows that a few weeks before the plant was closed, Catalina's owners took the precaution of officially dissolving the company. The same owners had played the same game in 2006 in France. There as well, the plant was closed, the workers occupied it, but in France, the owners were tried and convicted of breaking French law. In Windsor, union leader Jerry Farnham says that Canada has similar laws, but they are not enforced. Our government doesn't have the balls <laughs> to step up to the plate and go after what they, what's rightfully owed to the workers. And the, and the reality of the day, this part here really pisses me off because of the fact that the, the government has laws in place, but they're not being enacted on at all. These guys are, are heroes. In the end, Chrysler stepped in and paid the workers about a quarter of what they were owed and so the Aranco occupation ended. Unfortunately, only a handful of them have been able to find work in other plants. This is a nice truck, eh? Did you see For that? Ray Samard, forcibly retired from GM at age 49, the future looks a little scary. He realizes that he is unlikely to find a new career that pays anything like the auto industry, but he is ready to make the best of it. I still have young children that I need to put through university, so... There will be a change in, in, in my work employment. I'm not sure exactly what 
what door is going to open for me yet. I'm, I'm still, my dad was a carpenter and I may have to pick up my tool belt again. That's a possibility. The most devastating effects of the financial collapse are being felt in the countries that flew the highest during the global real estate boom. In Spain and in Dubai. Most workers around the world had little way to fight back against the effects of the meltdown. During the boom years, Spain was called the miracle of Europe. No more. At 6 a.m. every morning at the Plaza Elliptica in Madrid, immigrant workers from many countries line up and hope to be picked for a day's work by small contractors who drive by. With unemployment at 20%, they were the first to lose their jobs. The Spanish government recently offered to pay immigrants to go back to where they are from. Few took up the offer. Suleiman from Mali says he will hold on here in hopes that things will improve. But he sees no evidence that will happen. The real estate crash in Dubai has been even worse for the army of construction workers who came here from India and Pakistan and all over South Asia. They are paid on average $3 a day. Many of them have been thrown out of work. Many have not been paid for months. There were 200,000 laborers at once here. Um, and the practice is such that if you want to come to Dubai as a laborer, you just don't apply. You actually go to your home city in Bangladesh or somewhere in Karachi and pay a middleman money. So you're buying yourself a visa, okay? And, and while you're working, you're actually paying back maybe your prepaid visa rights through the first year. Um, so imagine if those guys didn't get paid for two or three months. Some of these workers went on strike demanding back pay. Dubai authorities started rounding up unemployed workers and forcibly expelling them from the country. For many, it is unclear whether it is worse to stay or to go home. Because many of them had to take on debt in their home country in order to get to Dubai to pay for their visas and sponsorship, they're, ac they're actually going to go home either at a loss or, in the worst case, indebted to money sharks in their home country. So in many ways, they're the biggest losers of the Dubai crisis. As the grim toll of the financial crisis continues to mount around the world, many governments are looking for the true causes of the meltdown. In many cases, what they are finding is criminal. Next time, the conclusion of Meltdown. We have endured the worst economic crisis of a generation. Wall Street came out exceedingly well. And now the elements are in place for it to happen all over again. Next year, next month, next week. The effect on the rest of us is going to be enormous. After the fall, next time on Doc Zone.